Thank you for coming to such an early talk after last night. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about is why your test suite sucks. So it's about testing. So just so I understand where we are, um, who's doing real test-driven development? Okay. And who's writing unit tests, some sort of automated test, maybe afterwards? Uh, and who just puts code into production and lets the users test? That's good, that's good. Wait for the phone to ring, see if it works. Um, <coughs> so I, I look after a testing tool, I'm a maintainer of a tool called PHP Spec. And in my job, I spend a lot of time delivering training to our customers. One of the topics we do training on is test-driven development. I do a lot of coaching with um, development teams who have problems. So I get to see a lot of different teams adopting TDD, different teams doing different kinds of testing. Um, and this talk is about some of the common problems I see when teams are getting really frustrated. I chose the title. <laughs> it is extreme because it's the feeling you get. You try something new, you try this TDD thing because someone told you it was a good idea, and you end up with a messy set of tests that are a pain to work with. It's very tempting to just throw it all away and say, this sucks. TDD's wrong. It doesn't work. They were lying to me. All those guys doing talks. Um, and you see it all the time in our community. If you Google TDD doesn't work or TDD is dead, you'll find blog posts explaining it's a waste of time. There's no point to it. DHH, the Rails guy, did a very influential blog post about why test TDD is a waste of time. <laughs> but from my perspective, when I, when I look at teams who are feeling this pain, at this point of thinking we should give up, the, the problem normally isn't TDD. Um, the problem is the way they are doing TDD is wrong. And it's very hard. It's a long journey to learn how to do it right. So this is why I've, d I've developed this talk. Um, so what does it mean when a test suite sucks? It means you're not getting value from the test suite. There's two parts to value. You spend some cost, you do some work, you write the tests, cost you time, which in a business is kind of like money. But you get some benefits. It does good stuff for you. So there's two reasons your test suite might have a problem. There's two, we two reasons you might be feeling this pain. One reason is you're, you're doing this stuff you're spending time, you're investing time in writing a test suite. Every time you write some code, you write some tests, but for whatever reason, you don't feel like the tests are helping you. You feel a good feeling inside because you're writing tests, and someone told you that was good, but maybe you don't feel all of the benefits you could be feeling. Or maybe the cost is too high. That's the other side. Maybe you're getting the benefits, but the way you're writing the tests, you're doing it in a way that is wasteful, maybe or hard to maintain, or every time you make a change, you find you're having to change the tests a lot. That's very common. So for the majority of this talk, we're going to go through different reasons you might be having a problem with TDD, looking at why that is, and looking at maybe some solutions of how to escape, not, not get into the same problem next time. And the first reason we'll look at is you don't have a test suite. That's why it sucks. It doesn't exist yet. How do you get from nowhere to having a good, maintainable test suite? Like I said, I work with a lot of different teams, so I get to see uh, people at different stages of adopting test-driven development, and I've kind of started to divide it into four phases. Four phases of testing, uh, which I call manual testing, automated testing, test first, and then test driven. So we'll go through each one and see if, if you're there, how do, you, how do you get to the next stage? So let's start with manual testing, which is what most teams start to do. It's very rare for someone to start their career doing test driven development. Um, some people inside our organization come out of university and 
immediately start doing TDD on projects. They think it's normal. But for most of us, we have to go through a period where we're not doing TDD. When you're manual testing, what you do is you design the code. Hopefully, you design the code. Maybe you don't. Um, you, s you think about it for a while. You maybe you draw a picture, talk to a colleague. You come up with some design. Then you type it into the computer, fix all the syntax errors, you write the code, and then you test it manually. Either you test it manually, or some, maybe someone else in your company tests it manually, or maybe your customers are testing it manually for you. Um, and I do find it amazing f from being used to test-driven development when I go and work with teams who aren't doing TDD, how much time they are spending testing. They don't think of it as separate testing time, but you'll be working with a developer and every couple of lines they'll be switching into a browser and hitting refresh and seeing if it has anything broken. What did I break this time? It kind of looks like it still works. I'm going to keep coding. There's a huge amount of time taken up doing that. And teams who are doing manual testing, they don't go straight into TDD. This is why I've split it into four phases. Because what problems are these teams having? Uh, when I make changes, stuff elsewhere unexpectedly breaks. Regression problems. I made a change to the finance system, and the marketing system stopped working completely. And it took me two days to notice. And the marketing team are really pissed off. Or you're not having those problems because you're spending a lot of time testing manually. Maybe you've got a separate team in a room somewhere of testers, and their job is to manually go through all the pages and check that the development team haven't broken stuff. So maybe the pain is that you've, you're spending a lot on testing, manual testing. And despite doing this stuff, bugs keep making it into production. So for teams like this, they don't care about this TDD is design stuff, which maybe you saw if you came to Casper's talk yesterday. What they care about is we want to test faster. We want the developers to start writing automated tests, either to have some tests because we don't have any yet, or maybe because the testing team are too expensive. We don't want to hire more testers. We want a machine to do this testing for us. So then the next step for this team is they're going to start writing automated tests after they write the code. So to get to that point, all they have to do is learn how to use the tools. Probably PHP unit. Um, it's probably the best tool for that. And you just need to do some tutorials, read some documentation, learn how to use the tools. You also need a team policy in place. So someone in the team needs to say, look guys, from now on, the code we write has to be covered with tests. We keep having bugs. We keep uh, spending time testing stuff. After you've finished coding, go and write some tests for it. And maybe we'll have a tool that monitors every pull request has some tests attached. I think that's a very natural first step. So once you've implemented all of that, your team is then doing automated testing. So what does automated testing look like? It means you design the code the same way you always did. You write the code the same way you always did. But then at the end, instead of manually testing it, you write automation tests. And this is better. You're spending less time on the testing side. You're writing the test once, and you can run it indefinitely. This is the journey I went through, definitely. I started doing automated testing in about 2005. And it took me probably another five years to tell people I was doing test-driven development. And then probably another three years before I was actually doing test-driven development. It's a very natural step. It's painful to test stuff. Let's automate that. It's natural for developers. I need to learn how to do it. We ha need to commit to doing it. So what problems do these people have, automated testing people? Oh, it's a pain to write the tests after I've done. I, I feel like I've finished writing my code, but we have a team policy in place that says I have to write tests, so I have to write these boring PHP unit tests afterwards that takes extra time. Possibly your manager starts looking at that step and says, this is costing a lot. Can we stop doing the testing? 
save some money. You also get problems like the test suite being brittle. When I make changes in the code, I have to update all the tests, and this is painful, and it feels like it shouldn't happen. But for some reason, the test suite's brittle. Maintaining it's hard. Writing unit tests feels like extra work because it's an extra thing you're doing at the end. And this is the point where people say TDD doesn't work. Say, I tried TDD, it doesn't work. I'll write a blog post about it, we'll delete the test suite, we'll go back to doing what we used to do. So the next step for these people is to start writing the tests before the code. And I'm not going to call that test driven, I'm going to call it test first. Before you write the code, you should write the tests. This problem of test brittleness is probably due to the tests being very based on the implementation. Maintaining the suite is hard work because it's something separate you do afterwards. It's not integrated into your process. If it felt more integrated, it wouldn't feel like extra stuff. So making that commitment to the sequence that you write the tests in, writing the test first, that's not something you can pick up in an automated way. You can't have a continuous integration tool that checks that the tests were earlier than the code. You just have to convince people it's a good idea. So you need a team leader who just persuades the team to try it. You need to do practices, practice sessions, code cutters, things like that, just to learn what the cycle feels like. You need influential leadership, someone in the team who does do TDD, and the others can see that it's working for that person. So they say, I will, I'll try writing the test first. I'll commit to doing it. So what does it look like when you're writing the test first? For me, when teams have just started writing the test first, it looks like this. They still design the code. They just don't type it in yet. So they have a picture in their head of exactly what the code is going to be like. Or well, they've drawn it all out on a whiteboard, and they know exactly what the code's going to be like, but because they've decided to write the test first, they stop themselves from writing the code. They then go and write a test. And when they're writing the test, they have this implementation in their head. So they've done all the thinking, but then they write the test. And then they implement that design. And you find, again, there's a benefit here. Implementing the design after you've written the tests is a lot faster. And your tests are naturally going to be a bit better because you haven't been coupled to the exact code you're going to write. The main thing here is that I, I believe this phase gets quicker. The code writing phase is faster. You've got a button you can press and everything still works great. But even with teams that do test first, they still have problems. And this is a big disappointment to those teams. They feel like they shouldn't have problems anymore. They're doing test, test first like they were told to. The kind of problems they have is that the test suite is still brittle. Brittle means that when I make a change in the code, the tests fail in a kind of unexpected way. It's really annoying. Small changes keep leading to wide-ranging changes in the test suite. It's still hard to update the bloody tests. <laughs> TDD still doesn't work. And it's because they're not doing test-driven development. They're doing all of their design before they write the tests. And this, for me, is really key difference. Unfortunately, there isn't a way to go from test first to test driven apart from practice. It just happens. As you're doing test first design, you'll find yourself thinking less and less before you start writing tests, and thinking more and more while you're writing the tests. So the design phase and the test writing phase merge together into one phase. So in test-driven development, you write the tests that describe behavior, and you're doing your design of the system during that test writing. So a lot of the time, you're opening the test file with no real preconception about how the class is going to behave. You've, you delay your thinking, and you do the thinking while you write the test. It becomes one phase. And then you implement a system that has that behavior. Uh, and of course, you don't have any problems then. What do we do with all this spare money? Where shall I go on vacation this year? Uh, maybe I can quit my job and retire, that kind of stuff. But that takes a long time, and it can take years. But I think understanding where you are in that process 
really helps. Am I just doing manual testing? Maybe I shouldn't be pushing a team who are doing manual testing to immediately start doing TDD. Maybe I just need to encourage them to start doing automated testing. If they're doing automated testing, I need to encourage them to start writing the tests first. And if they're writing the tests first, I just need to encourage them to keep doing that because they'll naturally become test driven. So we're going to look at some more specific reasons. Second reason your test suite sucks is your testing implementation. And this is most likely to happen when you're doing automated testing, or, or often test first development. Tests are about the external behavior of objects, the external behavior of the system, sort of black box tests. But it's very easy for us to accidentally couple our tests to specifics about how the code actually operates. Uh, and if you saw Casper's talk yesterday, he talked about <coughs> command query separation. It's this idea that method calls are either a query or a command. And if you're trying to do both at the same time, maybe there's a problem. This is just like in HTTP, we have either post or get. So some queries are just asking another object for data. Some method calls are just asking another object for data. This is a query. And some method calls are telling another object to do something. This is a command. And thinking about them separately is very important. So the first implementation problem I see in a lot of places is mocking queries. Mocking means asserting that the method call is definitely going to happen. Sounds innocent enough. When you're describing an be interaction between two objects that's a query, one object is going to ask another object for some information. You don't need to check exactly that how many times that method call is made. You don't need to check uh, too much about it. Because you shouldn't really care how many times a query is called. Specifying how many times the method is called is going to make it harder to change later. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, so this is a test that an object greets a person by name. So I have a mock user, a mock person. And the person um, knows that its get name method is going to be called exactly once. If you're familiar with PHP unit, this means the test will fail if it gets called zero times, and the test will fail if it gets called two times. And when that method's called, it's going to return Kieran. And then the object I'm actually testing I tell the greeter, greet this guy, and then I check that the greeting is hello, Kieran. And I've made a big mistake here, but I don't realize I've made a mistake yet. The mistake I've made is this once. It seems really innocent, but you've got to ask yourself, how do you know it's going to be called once? If it changes later to be called twice, should this test fail? If some other functionality checks that the user has a name first and throws an exception if it doesn't have a name, for instance, and then outputs the greeting, should that mean this test fails? It probably shouldn't. This test should succeed no matter how many times that method is called. Why have I put once in there? It's probably because I wrote the code first, and then I looked at the code, and I saw that it was called once. And I felt, well, it, I know that it does that, but I'm going to capture it in the test. But you should view that very much as an implementation detail. Or maybe just in your head you thought it's going to get called once. That is not important to this behavior. The behavior is there's a guy called Kieran. When you greet him, say hello, Kieran. You shouldn't be checking ha exactly how that happens. So this is simple to fix. Since PHP unit 4.0, Five, I think you can just do method get name will return here, which is look it reads the same. It conveys the same information to your colleagues who read the test. It's, if anything, it's easier to read. But you've removed this dependency that the method's called exactly once because that doesn't matter for this behavior. The behavior is still valid if the greeter has to check it twice. So anywhere where you see a query, where you say, this object is asking for some data, 
make sure you don't assert anything about the method call uh, in terms of frequency of calls. We just want to use a pure stub. So this is a stub in that it's just returning count data. We're not using it to check anything. The check happens here. We check that the return value is correct. You only need to use mocks for commands. This is where the thing we're testing is that the method is called. A related thing is testing the sequence of calls. I see this, again, in some PHP unit code bases, nearly always after the code has been written. So most of the time, we don't care what order calls are made in. Sometimes it's important, but a lot of the time it's unimportant. But I see people reading the code. They know what order the calls are made in, and so they capture that in their test. And again, this makes it hard to change. If a developer moves two lines around that don't affect the behavior, the test shouldn't fail. This is how you do it in PHP unit. Get a price list. The first time get prices is called, it will return 120. The second time get prices is called, it will return 200. I'm going to add two items to the basket. And I'm going to ask the basket to calculate the total. And we're assuming that that sequence is going to happen. It's better to use something like a return value map. We're assuming that the basket is going to iterate over the list from start to end, and we've captured that in the test. But maybe a developer will find some amazing optimization where it's faster to iterate backwards. That used to be true in JavaScript for some reason. Um, if the developer of this basket decides to change it so it loops backwards over the code, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter at all. So capturing the order of calls generally isn't a good idea unless you read the test, and the test is something like, this call definitely happens after the other call in the title of the test. The thing is saved after the total is updated. That's when you need to use order of calls. So in general, you, you should be focusing all of your effort on testing behavior, behavior you care about, not testing an implementation. Uh, the best way to do this is not have the implementation yet, write the test first. But even if you have written the code first, try and look at your tests again, evaluate them, and say, is this depending on internal implementation? If I deleted that class and rewrote it a different way, would the test still pass? Or would they fail in a weird thing that wasn't really related to what I'm testing? You can, as an exercise, it's a good thing to do when you're pairing. After you've written tests for an object, delete the object, and then try and write like the crappiest implementation that would pass the tests, but would clearly be wrong and broken. And then try and figure out which tests could I write that would make that not the case. I've done this with junior devs doing TDD. They write 20 test cases, and then you can delete the object and write three lines of code that pass all the tests. It's great fun. So another reason you might be having a problem with your test suite it's not about the tooling. It might be you just don't know how to design code. Um, there's something about unit tests. To be able to unit test a, a, an object, you have to be able to instantiate that object separate to everything else. It has to have very few dependencies. It has to not have complex behavior. It has to have clear single responsibilities. These are all amazing things for your object-oriented design as well. If your code doesn't look like that, if you have massive objects with tens of thousands of lines of code in them, it's naturally going to be hard to test. But you can't start blaming testing for that. That's because the design isn't very good. The design of the system isn't very good. We do tutorials a lot on TDD, and we show examples where we develop a small object, and you go through the TDD process, you end up with small, clean objects with short methods and like nice, clean names. And then I ask for questions at the end, and inevitably, someone puts their hand up and says, well, this is all good, but what about the real world? The real world where we have massive objects with crappy names and 500-line methods. And the answer is just don't write code like that. TDD stops you from writing code like that. That's not the way the code's supposed to look. 
So if that's what your code base looks like, your TDD is going to be hard. But the tests can show you, trying to write tests for a code base, it can, it can show you where the problems are. So one problem you might spot in your tests is you're creating too many doubles. You're calling get mock lots of times to make this code work. And this, your, your, your instinct might be, this is a painful part of TDD, but it's natural. But what it's actually telling you is your object has too many dependencies. If you have to create eight other objects to instantiate your object to test it, then your object probably has too many dependencies on the rest of the system. It's probably going to be very hard to change any of those one objects. So this is an example from a PHP unit test. I've got an invoice processor. But to make the invoice processor work, I have to give it charge rules, charge types, and a notifier. And inside each of my tests for the invoice processor, I'm going to have to stub the methods of these doubles. I'm going to have to set them up to return particular data or set them up to expect calls. And it can be really hard to write this kind of test. It's only three dependencies at this point. I've seen examples with like 10 classes having to be created. And the, but the problem isn't here. This is just showing you the problem. The problem is that your object has too many responsibilities. Um, possibly the charge rules and the charge types could be combined together. Possibly no having a notifier on an invoice processor is not a good pattern. Probably the invoice processor shouldn't be responsible for notifying people. You should decouple that somehow. Maybe use decoration or maybe trigger an event on an event dispatcher. Something like that. So anytime you see that you're having to create lots of doubles to write a unit test, you need to stop and think, maybe my object is crap. Can I get rid of some of these dependencies? Can I combine some of the dependencies together to create another level of abstraction? Or can I take some of the dependencies away and do that maybe they're not related to the core responsibilities of my object? Another very common issue I see in this area is stubs returning stubs. This means you create a double and you set it up, so one of the methods just returns another double. It normally means that your object doesn't have the right dependencies. So it's, got, it's, it's, being, it's, it's asking for the wrong objects. This is some example code. So I've got a user, I've got a contact, I've got an email, and I've got an emailer. Again, too many dependencies, probably. And I say to the user, when someone calls your get contact method, you're going to give them the contact object. And I say to the contact object, when someone calls your get email method, you're going to return this email object. And then I say to the emailer, someone's going to try and send an email to this address. And then I create the notifier. So we're testing the notifier. All of this is stubbing. So I'm not checking that these methods are called like we discussed. I'm just setting them up to return some data. And this is the thing that's actually the core of the test. This method is going to get called once with this parameter. So that's a good example of mocking. The, the point of the test is that this method is called. So I'm going to assert that the method is called one time. However, this is a mess. And this stuff is hard to set up. So why do we have this problem? Why are we having to return, why are we having to set up stubs that return stubs? It's probably because the code looks like this. My notifier is constructed with an emailer. But when I notify a user, immediately I call user get contact get email. And the email is the thing I actually use to send the email. This is a this is breaks a law called the law of Demeter. Breaks a principle called tell, don't ask. My code, just by doing a little chain of method calls like that, get the thing, get the thing, do something, immediately my object is now coupled to four objects. I have to understand user. So if user changes, this has to change. 
I have to understand contact has a get email. So if the contact object changes, this code has to change. I also have to understand the email. Uh, this is sometimes called a train wreck. It's, it's a consequence of data-driven design. It's a consequence of thinking about these objects first as like tables. It's thinking about these objects just as data storage and instead of thinking about what are their actual responsibilities. Get the thing, get the thing, do something is a really bad pattern. It's like going into a restaurant and say, you say to the waitress, get me the chef. And then the chef comes and you say, get me the guy who cooks the steaks. And he goes back and gets the guy who cooks the steaks. And then you tell that guy, I want a steak. Doesn't make any sense. You want to tell the waitress. So that's one option. We add a method. We change the dependency. So we say, actually, emailer knows how to send an email to a user. And we're going to push some of that responsibility into the user object. Now my class is just dependent on, on the user object and the emailer. I don't need to care about how the user object works internally anymore. Another option is, instead of passing the, e the user into the notify method, we pass the email instead. We figure out that's actually the thing that the notifier is interested in. It has to know about the email, but we can make it so it doesn't have to know about the users and it doesn't have to know about contacts. Again, we can change the dependency so it just gets the email directed, directly injected. This makes our test easier. Test automatically gets cleaner. I've got an email that is actually a, uh, what's called a dummy. It's not even set up with any stubbing. It's, n its methods aren't set up to return any data. There's no expectations. It's just there to be handed around. I have an emailer, which is a mock. It's got an expected method call. So the whole point of this test now is when this thing happens, this method call happens. And it's easy to not take that step. It's easy to write this test and then say, grr, PHP units, mocking libraries, terrible. It's really verbose. But it's telling you something. It's screaming out that your dependencies are wrong. And you should look again at the code. So stubs returning stubs mean that the dependencies are probably wrong somewhere. As soon as you have a stub that returns a stub, you should think, maybe I shouldn't be injecting this object at all. Maybe I should be giving the thing that my code really wants to work with. Um, and in fact, if you use the library called Prophecy, stubs returning stubs is deliberately hard to do. It's deliberately not very easy. Another common problem, trying to partially mock the object you're testing. The tools for doing this in PHP unit, I don't think they're appropriate for unit tests, but they're useful for integration tests and things. So it's a very common question. We get it all the time on, I work on Prophecy, which is a mocking library. And we get the question all the time, how can I like, replace some of the methods on the object I'm testing? That would be really handy. It's easy to do in some tools. Generally, it means our object has too many responsibilities. So I'll give an example of when the kind of things people want to do this for. So I've got some kind of form, my form object, that's going to handle some data. And internally, it calls validate. And then I've got a validate method that does something crazy involving form validation. That's always hard. So. Uh, I'm not even sure it's possible to write a clean form implementation anymore. But the fact that this internally calls validate means some developers say, well, there's only two cases here. There's a case where validate returns false, and there's a case where validate returns true. And I just want to test the handle. So you can do this in PHP unit. What you do is instead of instantiating your form, you ask the mocking library, please generate something that's like my form object, except we're replacing just the validate method. And validate's going to return true. So when I call handle, handle will return the phrase valid. 
This does make sense. But when you find yourself wanting to do this, you've got to stop and think, what's my motivation here? Why am I trying to achieve this? What is it I'm trying to achieve? I'm trying to make one method in my object treat another method as a stranger. I'm trying to say these are separate parts of the system. I'm trying to test them independently. I don't feel like I can write a test for the handle method. Even though this is protected, I feel like I'm having to stub this to test handle. And this is probably going to stay untested. Really what I'm trying to do is make two parts of the object separate. It's telling me, it's screaming out, the object has too many responsibilities. It's handling a form and it's doing validation. And the fact I want to try and test them independently is telling me they should be different objects. If they're different responsibilities, they should be different objects. So this validate method should be pulled into an object. Call it a validator, pass it in at construction time. Handle can use the validator's validate method. Very often you discover this later. You build an object and you figure out, oh, it's now it's doing too much, I have to deal with it. So the test becomes simpler. I make a mock of the validator. I tell it its validate function will return true. I test my real object again. I stop doing that partial mocking stuff. I create it with the validator, call handle, and check the result is the same. And as a side effect, I've now got a separated validator object. So maybe I'm going to be able to change the validation strategy later without editing the form. Maybe I'm going to uh, be able to reuse that validation somewhere else in the system. So if you find yourself trying to control what a protected or private method inside the system under test is doing, it pretty much means you should have more than one object. You're trying to, you're trying to split your object down the middle and treat the halves separately. You should actually just do that. Split it down the middle, make them separate classes. These are all design things. And TDD does not make you a good designer. You have to learn object-oriented design as well. But it does come with practice. The way to be a better software designer, uh, first thing is start thinking about your code first, before you start typing. Uh, maybe think about documenting your ideas, draw them, make some notes. And ultimately, instead of doing that, start by writing a test. Start by writing a test that explains what your code is going to do. A kind of related issue is that um, when you're using these tools just as testing tools, it takes extra time, right? This is why people feel it's painful sometimes. If it's something you're doing afterwards, it feels like it's an extra step that you're forcing yourself to do. Even when you're writing the test first, it feels like some extra thing that I have to do. Please, for God's sake, don't ever have a ticketing system where you count the time writing tests separately. Please never do that, because a manager will look at it and say, we're spending thousands of pounds on writing tests. We should stop. Like When you're not doing TDD, you spend some time. This is aggregated over lots of little times. Maybe you spend over about an hour thinking about stuff. Maybe you spent about 30 minutes typing the code, but a lot of the time was spent looking out the window thinking. And then maybe 30 minutes checking, it's, checking it works. When you get all the way to TDD, you spend an hour thinking still, but while you're thinking, your hands are typing in tests. That's how you're doing the thinking. And this takes about the same time to implement it, maybe less time. But then checking it works becomes incredibly cheap. You think of TDD as a design process, it just becomes a natural tool you're using to design code. And then as a side effect at the end, you have a button you can press that tells you that your application works. That's magical to me. So ultimately, you should use your test suite as a way to think about the code, a way to reason about the code. Uh, I, I, I'm making these points because I see a lot of teams under pressure to not do TDD, but customers can't 
tell you how to design your code. If TDD is a design tool, asking you to not do it is as crazy as saying, please don't have a whiteboard, or please try not to think about stuff before you start typing. Or why are all the developers speaking to each other about code? They should be typing the code in. It's that kind of crazy stuff. Um, so I think the final reason we'll look at for why your test suite sucks, and this is a, a larger scale, is the most common reason is you're trying to unit test across domain boundaries. So you're trying to unit test stuff that is too big to unit test, perhaps. Or you're trying to unit test stuff that's a mixture of your code and someone else's code. So you're having to take on board responsibility for testing their code as well. So the first issue we'll look at, testing third-party code. And obviously we don't test someone else's code. We don't download a framework and then start writing unit tests for that framework before we start using it. That would be mad. But there's a subtle way where you can accidentally test other people's code. That's by extending other people's objects. So as soon as you extend an object from a framework, you are using someone else's code. So you're creating a class that's a mixture of code you're writing and a code someone else is writing. If you want to test that, that means you're going to have to test your code and someone else's code together. And that time's pretty much wasted. You should normally just trust that the framework you're using works. If you don't trust it, switch framework or become a contributor to that framework. But that should be separate from your normal project development. So let's see an example. Um, extending a third party object. An obvious one is extending some kind of repository. It's, it's kind of simplified. It's something like Doctrine, where you think, well, this object does most of what I want pretty much does what I want. I'm going to extend it and just override the bits I don't like. This approach makes it very easy to write code. I just extend the framework repository and I add a new method find by email that calls the parent object's find method with the structure that I know will return the correct results. Code like this is really hard to write tests for. Why is it hard to write tests for? Well, the first thing I have to do is instantiate this object. Uh, but I can't see its constructor. The parent might have a constructor. So I have to go and read the parent object, understand the parent object, and figure out what dependencies it has, figure out what behavior it has that's going to make this test possible. You end up with something like this. So I've, I've figured out it needs a database connection. I figured out it needs a thing called a schema creator. I don't know what that is. I just saw it was in the constructor signature, so I put it in there. Um, it seems to need a thing called a the schema creator. Seems to need to create a schema, so I'm mo I'm doubling the schema. I'm saying when you call get get schema on the schema creator, it'll return the schema. When you call get mappings on the schema, it's going to return this array. I don't know why that array works. It just seemed to work when I wrote the test. Uh, and then I mock the database is going to return this data. And then finally, I can create my object using the dependencies that the framework needs. I can call find by email, and I can check that a user came back. So this code probably took me a minute to write, and the test maybe took all morning to write. And ultimately, I don't really have much. I knew it worked from the start. I knew that was going to work. The whole point of using this library is that it's it's well tested in its own right. I know that over I know that writing a method like this is going to do the right thing. It was probably a waste of my time writing that unit test. So I've got two I've got two options. I can either just write this code and assume it works, or I can change the way I interact with the third party object. This is an inheritance-based uh, solution. If I switch to using composition instead, my problems go away. The problem I have here is that by extending, you're taking responsibility for the code some other guy wrote. And you're taking responsibility for understanding how the object works. 
If I switch to composition instead, instead of extending the framework repository, I inject it in a constructor. My code's slightly more complicated. It might take me two minutes to write instead of one minute. But the test is going to be a lot simpler because now to test this object, I don't have to understand how the repository works, how the framework repository works internally. My test creates a framework repository. It tells the framework repository when find is called with this data, you're going to return a user object. I don't care what the dependencies of the framework repository are because you know, I, don't, I just generally don't care. My repository gets the framework repository as a dependency and I check that when I call find by email, then the user gets returned. Again, that's not going to take long to write. It's kind of clearer what's happening. It's not got all these concerns from some other project hidden in my test. So when you extend third-party code, you're, you're taking responsibility for the design decisions that some other person who wrote that framework made years ago. You have to understand how it works. You favor the composition over inheritance. Composition's strength is that you don't care how the other object works internally at all. You don't have, you don't, you're not able to use those internals. You only care about the other object's public API. However, there's something I've done here. I've created a double of an object I don't own. So this test is okay, but a lot of people will argue that you shouldn't write this test either. Doubling third-party code is itself a problem. Um, we use mocks, stubs, and fakes to test how objects communicate. To be able to describe that communication, we have to understand what language the other object's speaking. And if that ob object is written by someone else, we might make faulty assumptions about how that conversation's going to go. Um, it's kind of like when you're writing a unit test that involves communication between objects, you're, like, you're describing a conversation that those objects are going to have. So it's like um, before I, uh, at the end of the year, I want a raise. So I'm going to go and talk to my boss. His name's Marcelo. Uh, and I practice the conversation beforehand. I say, so I'm going to say to Marcelo, give me uh, 10,000 pounds more every year. And he's going to say, yes, great. You've done a great job this year. And I'll say thank you, and that will be the end. Now, that doesn't work, because I, I don't really know how Marcelo is going to react. I didn't write Marcelo. I don't control Marcelo. So when I, in real life, when I go and have that conversation, it's going to go differently. Here's an example of some code that's doubling a third party. So I'll show the architecture first. It's something like this. We've got some cloud storage provider, and they provide an API. Uh, this is based on a real life thing I had with Amazon. And I'm writing an object called file handler. The idea of file handler is it's going to validate the file, and then it's going to use the API to upload. Okay. So how do I test file handler? I've got a validator that I'm writing. And the cloud API is something I've got from Composer somewhere. I have to write something like this. The validator is a double, the client's a double, and the file is a double. The validator, which I wrote, I say validate. When, you, when, when I ask you if the file is valid, say, say that it is valid. And then I'm mocking, that, it, that is describing specifically the method calls. This is what I want to test. I want to test that the file gets uploaded. So I have to check that um, start upload gets called, and then upload data gets called, and then I stub that upload successful is going to return true. 
So I'm checking that when I try and upload a file, that my object is going to make three specific method calls to the cloud API. Right? And then I run the test. And the test in, in real life is more complicated than this in real life, but the test passed. It was green, and I felt good about myself. I thought the file handler object works. And then I didn't really trust the unit test. Something in the back of my head was telling me, you need to check this actually works. So we wrote a script that used the file handler object, uploaded a file, and nothing happened. The file wasn't on the cloud provider. So why did that happen? It turned out there's another method I have to call called finalize upload that has to happen before the files there on the storage. Because I didn't write the API of this object, I didn't write the cloud API, I've got no way of detecting that error. You could just say maybe I'm stupid and should read the documentation better. But my point is I wrote a unit test that passed, but because it was describing communication with a third party that I don't control, I can make mistakes. I can have this fairy story where everything passes. This is exactly what's going to happen. It all goes green. But then I still feel like I need to test it in real life to check that that is the three methods I should be calling. And the reason we've got this problem is it's a coupled architecture. If you draw where the domain boundaries are, I've got my core domain. I'm writing a file handler, and I'm writing a validator. But mixed into that is the third party domain. There's the component that the third party provided, but also my file handler inside it has some concepts from that third party domain. That's why I'm having this difficulty. And I'm not going to be able to effectively unit test this object. I can write a unit test. What I'm saying is I can't effectively unit test it. Maybe my time writing that object is wasted. Maybe my code won't work when it goes on to production. So how do we solve this? We separate out the domains. The way to do this is instead of depending directly on the cloud API, my file handler depends directly on an interface. An interface I write. So I decide what the methods of that interface are. I decide what the correct types, arguments are. I decide what the return values are going to be. I then have to write a separate adapter. You could consider this a different layer that implements the interface and knows what calls to make on the cloud file store. Remember, the problem we're solving is how to test this object. And now I can unit test all of these objects that are just inside my core domain. The unit test becomes very simple. The double I'm making, I know this says class, but actually that's an interface. It's just PHP's funny. Uh, I'm going to double the file store interface. I'm going to get a double of a file. When I call validate on the um, validator, it's going to return true. And I check that. Uh, uh, missing an expectation. I should also check that file stores upload file method is called. And then I check that everything happens correctly. And then the only way I can check that this stuff works, I can then, so I've verified that everything inside my core domain works using unit tests. And the unit tests have absolutely no dependency on any infrastructure. And the conversations I'm describing inside the unit tests are all conversations between objects that I control. So I know that the conversations are correct. How do I test this? The only way I can test it is with integration tests. I could write a unit test for this object, but it will have the same problem. I won't really know it works until I've tried it with the real cloud storage API. So this is where an integration test comes in. I'd keep it in a separate suite of tests, and the integration test is going to test that my adapter with the real third-party SDK, with a real cloud service, when I tell it to upload a file, a file appears on the cloud storage. It's going to be slower. It might cost something. I'm going to have to set up a test server. 
So I create a real file. I create, I instantiate the API with some test credentials. You have to ask them for a testing account, something like that. I tell it to upload, and I check that the file exists. It seems like a pain. But this object only has one method. There might be loads of objects in my domain that try and upload files using the interface, but the interface itself only has one method. So there aren't going to be many tests that I have to write. I'm not going to write a lot of integration tests. I'm going to write one integration test that where a file successfully uploads. I might write an integration test for if someone tries to upload a file that doesn't exist, there's a problem. But that's about it. Maybe something about the service timing out. This gives you a sort of pyramid of tests. We have lots and lots of fast running unit tests and a small number of integration tests. And in fact, if you're doing end to end testing as well using browser automation, you may find that those integration test scenarios are going to be covered. If you have acceptance tests that cover everything all together, you can probably cut out the integration tests. So the point of this is don't. We don't test other people's code because we don't really know what it's supposed to do. But we also shouldn't test how we talk to other people's code because we don't really know how their code is supposed to respond to us. So I've talked about a lot of stuff. In general, the best use of testing is to drive development, but it's a long journey to get there. Um, try and use TDD to replace your existing design practices, not some extra thing you have to do at the end. And when you do get stuck, don't give up. Either improve the tests or improve your code. Maybe you're testing the implementation too much. Maybe the problems you're having is just that the design of your code needs to improve. Or maybe the problems you're having is that you're testing over these infrastructural boundaries. You're trying, your tests are covering the core logic and infrastructure. These are the photos I used. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Um, please rate the talk. I'm joined in.